good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Spizer. I'm the superintendent here. Thanks for being a part of our first uh, community engagement regarding the new middle school. Uh, this evening, we have S SHP is here. Um, Charlie will do all the introductions for uh, himself, his firm, along with Conger Construction. Uh, we're here to just engage, get some feedback. Um, Charlie will lead the session for us. And we'll, we will have a Q&A towards the end uh, as well. So we'll have a few of us running around with microphones. We are on uh, ICRC this evening, so it is being recorded as well. So I'll turn it over to Charlie. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, we will try to keep this within about 60 minutes. So uh, we buckle in because there's a lot of stuff. So as uh, Mr. Spicer said, we're uh, introducing the team. Uh, we're going to look at the schedule. Uh, we've also gone on some new school tours. We'll show you some photos of that. Um, we are in the programming phase. And so we've, we've, we've gone through the requirements. We'll look at that. And then we've got some diagrams. Um, Real quick before I get in, into introductions, um, the way our project is organized is somewhat of a triangle. At the top, you see the we refer to them as a co-owner. So, um, Milford Exempted Village School District and OFCC are the considered the co-owners. Um, and then within that, we, SHP is on the design side. So under us is all architecture, interior, civil, structural, mechanical, technology, design. And then the other component is Conger Construction, and they will uh, manage all the work, and they will hold all the contracts and the subcontracts for the project. So in an ideal situation, it's set up where there's two POs, and, and actually, that's, that's how it is right now. There, there'll be a third one for another kind of third party on, on the engineering side, but the state sets it up where it's, it's pretty uh, simple to run. This is also called the core team, so you may hear me use the phrase the core team. Um, they make a lot of the decisions. That, that group is tasked with making sure the scope, schedule, and budget are maintained. So that's, that's really the, the goal of the core team. Uh, before I get into that, I'd like to introduce a couple more folks. Um, again, my name is Charlie Janigan. I'm, I'm an architect. Um, been working f with Milford since 2013. I started, d I designed Boyd and Seipelt. I was a part of this building, uh, elementary re-roofs, and some other miscellaneous projects. So it's been a, it's been a great run. Uh, Greg Lewis is here. Uh, Greg's a, a lead designer for SHP, and he's um, driving a lot of the design decisions within our team today. Russell Miller is not here. He's our PM, um, but he is, is, gonna, is on the job from now all the way until the ribbon cutting. And then last but not least is Jordan Hibner. Jordan is an interior designer, um, and she also is a resident, may or may not live on Price Road, so. Um, so our team, uh, the way we're organized, the, the SHP team, uh, there's a lot more than just, just the, the three of us here today. Um, we've got um, a whole slew of other architects and designers, um, landscape, interior design, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and for the most part, all these people, uh, all day, every day, design and, and, and work in schools. Uh, Kleinger's is our civil engineer. They get involved with the roadway design, stormwater, utilities, um, things in, in the ground. Um, we have a structural engineer, our kitchen designer. We have a, a technology designer. Uh, some other things as far as inspections and, and dirt. Fun topic to talk about community meetings. Uh, and then finally, we have an uh, environmental consultant. Um, they, they advise on the demolition of um, the existing junior high. So large team. Uh, and our team is, is, is uh, really excited to be a part of this project. Uh, I know f I might be new or our company might be new, but we did want to share some of the experience that we have, specifically in middle schools. Um, behind me is, is a listing of a variety within the region. Uh, Lebanon uh, Junior High is a, is a kind of a local one. Uh, Seven Hills is a private school of Norwood. Uh, we're doing some stuff at Sycamore, so we, we really know uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, we've got a lot of experience in designing those and understanding kind of the changes that these kids are seeing when they're in, within those school buildings. Right now, I want to turn it to Conger to talk about, uh, introduce themselves and, and the way they're organized. So, Justin. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Justin Conger, uh, President and CEO of Conger Construction Group. Bob, come on up too. Uh, Bob Riggs is our pre-construction manager. So you'll see a lot of uh, Bob's face around, especially early on in pre-construction. So as we work through with the SHP team, right? There's projects always pre-construction, all the design work, you know, we're gonna be working as part of the team and as part of that triangle 
with the SHP team working through logistics, budgeting, phasing, some of the, the key kind of behind the scenes things that happen before we ever you know, put a bucket in the ground, a shovel in the dirt, uh, a screw gun to the metal studs and drywall. So um, that's the great thing about this delivery method is working together as a team early on and you know, working through different uh, phases, parts, pieces, and components. Uh, Bob's got a tremendous amount of experience. Uh, we've had the great opportunity of working with a lot of school districts, as you can kind of see based upon uh, just some of the data points up here on the screen. Um, you know, Lebanon Junior High we did with uh, SHP. We're also finishing up uh, uh, Fairborn Middle School up in, in Dayton with SHP right now, and we're working on a couple other uh, projects in the Dayton market. So, you know, uh, family-owned and operated business. I was telling Charlie when I walked in, uh, my wife actually taught at, at Meadowdale, or Meadowview, sorry, um, years ago, so before we decided to have um, a number of children, so she's uh, helping on the home front, doing a great job at that, but uh, again, we appreciate it. it we're working with the state and having you know, constructed uh, over you know, 1.2 million square feet uh, and over $400 million in K-12 schools in the last 15 years. We understand this delivery method. We understand the market. You know, it's our job to kind of continue to work with the SHP team, work with the co-owners. Um, so again, you know, a little bit about us. Uh, our mission at Conger Construction is to build a solid future. We do that by building solid lives for our employees who can build solid families to go and build solid communities, and we do that by building solid structures. Um, so we live and breathe that every day. This is our why. This is why we exist. Um, and this is why we're involved in the K-12 construction market. You know, what a, a school does to a community, how it builds into the community, the things that it provides uh, for the students, the teachers, the staff, the community members, and how they rally around that. That's a, a great thing that we love to be a part of. Um, it helps us um, really make an impact. Again, we're fortunate enough, we just build buildings. They do a lot of the hard work. Uh, and it's our job to bring their vision to life. And uh, SHP has done a fantastic job of, you know, visioning and working through the program and requirements and working with that team uh, is where, you know, the rubber meets the road. And then we get to just execute that. We get to do the dirty job, uh, but that's okay. We like that. We like playing in the dirt. We like making messes. Um, it's, it's fun. It's kind of who we are. So, again, we appreciate the opportunity. We appreciate... Um, and we look forward to the next, you know, two, three years of working together in this community with this team um, and being a sounding board and being a, a part of this program. So thank you. Great. All right. Uh, a couple more uh, intro pieces. Um, we, as you hear, have had a lot of experience in the school market. We've got some good processes. Uh, our process is really built on gathering information and, and soliciting feedback through the users. Uh, and constituents is what you guys are. So um, you can see we've got the co-owners at the top. We've got our core team, again, design, construction, and district. Um, and then today we just met with our design team. So it's, uh, principal, superintendent, Mr. Johnson, the, we're, we've got a core group kind of helping make sure a lot of these decisions are going. We will then be talking with a lot of folks. We will have department meetings where we meet with just the kitchen staff. We will have meetings with uh, the science staff. We will have meetings with the custodial staff. Uh, we're going to have dedicated meetings with the uh, with mechanical, electrical, plumbing, with the technology staff. Uh, we will continue to have community meetings like this so everyone can see and hear what's being discussed and, and agreed upon. Um, so we, we know when we're utilizing public money that, that we need to be transparent, communicate, communicate, communicate. So our process is built on kind of pushing it up and pushing it down so everyone's in the loop. Um, the schedule, that's critical right now. Uh, our success is driven by staying on schedule. Um, and so right now we are at the point where the programming has been about the first six weeks and we're just entering that initial kind of schematic design phase. So we interviewed, I believe, late March and kind of got the green light early April. Um, and so in the, about the past six weeks we've been, we've been programming. It's a little bit of a challenge to start programming a school when everyone else is really focused on summertime so um, what we've gotten through it and, and um, the, the principals at the junior high did a great job kind of preloading us with the quant numbers they needed um, and um, you'll see some of that in a second 
we're, as I said, we're entering schematic design. Schematic design is really when we start to play with the pieces and we start to arrange the building into a floor plan. You'll see some of those diagrams of the academic wing here shortly, um, but that will go for about 13 weeks. We will then kind of lock in a floor plan and we'll pull it up 3D and it'll start to become masses and we'll start to then put some architecture to it and really uh, see what this vision will look like of, of what the building will be. At that point, we take a pause. Uh, we hand it over to these guys, and they will estimate it, and, and we will take a, a look at how we look into, on the budget. Um, and at that point, we make decisions on are we on budget, are we over budget, and what do we need to do to, get, to stay on budget. Um, in this market, that is really, really challenging um, because of just the, the rising prices of materials and, and the supply chain things we're seeing. So we're also making decisions early on on things that we need to buy in advance. We're, we've entered a market where there are a lot of commercial construction pieces that are year, a year out, a year out to get electrical switch gear. So we might be buying electrical switch gear way early just so we can electrify this building on time. We will then enter a design development phase. It's kind of the middle third. Uh, a lot more engineering is occurring. We start to really have uh, itemized things as far as duct runs and length of pipes and sizes of pipes. Again. We hit pause, we send it over to Conger, and they estimate it, um, and then do that same uh, budget reconciliation, and then finally we enter construction documents, and that'll, that'll wrap up uh, roughly about a year from now. So um, it's, it's, it, this is a big building. This is going to have thousands of hours of time of people designing and engineering and calculating and going through jurisdictional reviews to make sure we can build a safe uh, building that our kids can learn in. From there, uh, 2023, early on, we, we will have an early site package, so we're thinking maybe we might give an early package, so a year from right now, there might be some dirt starting to move, maybe June 23, June, July 23. Um, and then we'll really hit into the, the major construction of the building, so we've planned about 27 months, which would have the building done in August of 25. Um, I laughed when I got this RFQ, because it was the first RFQ I've had that's that far out, 20, the year 2025. And then we actually have, we'll then take down the old junior high that fall, wrap up the site work, and then have everything kind of done early 26. So uh, we are on schedule right now. And um, again, w w our success is driven by staying on schedule, making decisions, and um, making sure everyone's nodding their heads and saying, proceed. Um, this is just a quick kind of study that we've shared of uh, just this, the plan. This is the existing site plan of the campus. Um, we know that there's Eagles Way that kind of goes around. Uh, you've got the junior high right here, the various fields throughout. Obviously, the high school is, is a large mass. And the most logical spot to build is right here where there's three practice fields. So that's, that's kind of the build, buildable area that we've identified. That was identified a long time ago during the bond issues. Um, we will ultimately build a building there, um, and you'll see some more diagrams here in a second. Um, and so at some point, we are going to have three school buildings up uh, on the campus. So we cannot take this one down until this one's up and running until we have certificates of occupancy and life safety. So it's going to be a hectic site, um, but we're working with Conger on figuring out how to get trucks on and how to maintain all the site circulation aspects of this, of this, this campus. Uh, we've all had the fortune of coming here at 2.30 and seeing cars stacked on Wolf, Wolf Pen. Uh, we've s seen things in the morning of, of drop off and pick off. It's, it's a hectic site, and we're going to do what we need to do to hopefully stay out of the way uh, uh, during these operations. Uh, this is the kind of the, f the, the final phase of the junior high is gone. We're going to reconstruct fields there that we've displaced that were over here. Uh, we are going to reorganize Eagles Way to be kind of more front-facing. Right now, it's somewhat of a back-facing drive. Make it a little more grand. It might be more, you know, there might be a few more trees or lights to light it up, and it, it'll be a little more prominent than what it is today. Um, and so we, there's a lot of things that need to happen here. We need to work with engineers. We need to get a traffic study. I know one th thing that causes people to say, what is we've got a little s small roundabout. That's just representative. We don't know if we're going to do that or not. We need to really study it. But looking at site flow and traffic flow, traffic engineers would, are recommending that. But we need to get to that point of locking it in. So um, uh, one thing that we did do early on is, is we said to the, the, the design team, what buildings have you been in? They said, well, we come here every day. We're in this school building. We're in 
Milford Junior High built in 1968. So we said, let's go on a tour. So we went and we visited three buildings. Uh, the first one was Harrison Junior, junior High. Um, this is also a 678 building. It is also a uh, OFC building. So it's the same kit apart. So it was really good to go there. It's 185,000 square feet. It's three stories and it opened up fall 2021, right, Jordan? Just this past fall. So it's still, they were still in their first school year. Um, we took our group through there and really started to see a lot of the components. And our team said, hey, we really like this or we don't like that. And that's the point of doing that. One of the things the team liked was this learning stair. Uh, this is a stair that is, connects the cafeteria to a, a media center. Um, the principal spoke very highly of it, so the kids love it. Uh, there's, there's outlets on it. Kids can charge phones. They can charge Chromebooks before after school. It's used a lot. It's kind of the heart of the school. Um, the school is, is big enough where it had a courtyard. It was an internal courtyard. Um, it's driven for a couple of reasons. One is for daylight. Uh, two is some, for some secured outdoor play. Um, and we, we toured that to see because we have a job that's probably large enough where it's going to warrant a courtyard or, or going to have fingers off of it to, because it's so big to be to have daylight in every space. Um, so it's a discussion point, of, you know, and at this point with the contractor at the table, how, how are we going to build it? How are we going to design it? How are we going to make it function? Uh, here are some photos of our team. Uh, this is looking at the uh, kind of above the media center. You'll notice there's no doors on it, wide open. Um, the principal, we said, how, how bad is a problem of security? And he says, well, there's one thing that book that aren't stolen, books. People aren't stealing books. So he said, We're, in the first year, they have not had a problem with people even during volleyball or basketball in the evenings of, of, of messing with it. The open concept of library is very common these days and we're not seeing problems with it. We went to a classroom that had a shared teaching wall and it was open when we toured it. This is the principal standing here in white and he said to the kids, raise your hand and tell me the best things about the school. And these kids shouted out these wonderful things about daylight, air conditioning, collaborative teaching spaces. Um, I think they said the colors. Um, so they, they it was refreshing to see a student's perspective. From there, we went to Fairfield Freshman School. Uh, this is a similar size building. It was opened in 2016. Um, it was also OSFC. Um, and uh, just a little bit different flavor, though, than, than the Harrison job. Uh, this job has some pretty strong branding identity. Obviously, you see Fairfield, you see the Indian, uh, and the red kind of welcoming gateway there. Um, after you walk in that red gateway, this is right behind it. It is, a, it is their common area, but it's also their cafeteria. They also had a large learning stair. But the thing we found there is the principal says, we don't use it. We don't let the kids on there. And um, it, so it was kind of a, pr a behavioral thing that they just elected to not use it. And so if, as designers, we go back and say, oh, well, that's kind of a waste if you're not going to use it. So uh, we, all, we stood on it. Our team did. And it, it just felt different. It was, it, it was all concrete. The one, the one here at Harrison was, was a little warmer. And so we've talked about some of the things that we liked and we didn't like. Um, we looked at some breakout spaces within the classroom. So this is showing you kind of something that we call an ELA, extended learning area. This is a classroom back here. It actually has a garage door that opens up. And then this is the, the, the man door to go in and out. Um, we talked about if they use that and how they collaborate and how they, maybe they allow kids to flex and move. So it was nice to just hear, now that they've been in the school for five, six years, how it's really, it's really aging. And then the last school that we toured was uh, Witten Woods. Um, this is a kind of combo school. It is a um, seven, eight side and then a nine through 12 side. And we kind of stayed to the, the seven, eight side. Um, this particular school really threw all the rules out. They decided to not have a cafeteria. They decided to not have a media center. Um, and then they took all that area that they would ordinarily have and they spread it throughout all the learning spaces. So um, the building itself um, has some kind of unique components to it. Uh, this is, this is a, a neighborhood is what they refer to for seventh graders. Back here is a teacher kind of collaborative room where the teachers all reside. Um, and then from there, depending on what they're teaching, they then take a laptop and they go to a particular room and teach teach their kids so they might they don't have assigned classrooms there um, they also feed their kids breakfast and lunch um, a lot of them are on free and reduced and so they have a distributed dining men mentality so they they eat with food during class 
Um, there is systems to distribute all the food and to, to, to eat, um, but it's a part of their learning and a part of their instruction. Um, and they've said that behavioral problems have gone down dramatically, um, and the overall they've been in their building for the first year also, and they, they've seen a great success on just um, student engagement and, and participation. Um, they also had a nice learning stair here. This is actually a, on the high school side, but you can see there's, there's booths, there's different seating, a very collegiate feel. It, feels a, 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 it doesn't feel like a typical school. And that's what they were trying to pr promote to these kids is, is that this is a great opportunity and let's, take, let's, let's make the most and, and, and give these kids the best so they can flourish. Um, uh, you know, a lot of hangout spaces and, and they know that a lot of learning comes from just kind of the, this, 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 these uh, impromptu opportunities to, to engage with folks. So, uh, but then this can also be set up in a formal manner. Actually back here is a screen as large as this screen where presentations can occur. And, and teaching or lectures can happen. Uh, they had some outdoor spaces there, again, for some outdoor dining. Uh, they have a chess set that was built in, um, and, they, and I think the teacher said that they love to use it to give secured outdoor play, fresh air, where, where, where kids can go outside. Um, here's a couple more shots. Again, this was a teacher leading us through. We were asking a lot of questions about soft seating, carpet, you know, so a lot of those functionality and operational things that, that we need to consider in designing a new school. So overall, um, our team kind of concluded they liked the, the layout of Harrison Junior School. It just it, they felt that it fit Milford. It felt the it fit the way the kids learn here, and, and that they will learn in the future. Um, they liked the medium ELA spaces at Fairfield Freshman School. Harrison had extended learning areas, which are like flexible zones, but they were about two or three hundred square feet. Um, Fairfield had ones that they were closer to a thousand or twelve hundred square feet. And then um, Witten Woods had like two or 3,000 square feet. They, they thought that that was kind of a wasted space. And again, it was, they got rid of a cafeteria to do that. It was cafeteria square footage. Uh, did not like the large GLAs at Witten Woods. Um, liked the learning stair at uh, Harrison Junior High, the warmth of the wood, just the functionality of it, kind of the, man, in the middle. We talked about landings in the middle landing and the way it was arranged. And we walked the stairs and we sat on them and looked at sight lines. So. Um, Harrison had a second floor media center and that was kind of a nice actually bridge to connect people from downstairs in the cafeteria and, and bring them up. It's a common space and it forces you to kind of use those, those learning stairs and the adjacency to the cafeteria. The courtyards, again, kind of a minimalist. We know that, that having courtyards can be challenging for schools. There's, you know, there is a courtyard at the junior high right now. It's full of grass. It's not really well maintained just through the years it's aged. We want to program it where it's functional and people go out there and they use it and they feel comfortable. Maybe there's built-in seating and there's items, you know, amenities to make it to make it be a destination rather than just grass and we just cut grass out there. Um, would like to incorporate branding. Obviously, Milford has a very strong uh, brand identity with, with uh, the logo you see behind me. Uh, and we will try to incorporate some of that within the, the space. We talked about certain rooms, uh, life skills lab, or in a community room. We saw a variety of, through the, the tours, and we kind of concluded on we're going to have a hybrid room. Um, we looked at one of the schools had two gyms. Um, one was on the upper floor, one was on the lower floor. They were connected in one space, but we just talked about the pros and cons of having that and, and what it meant. So finally, I'll show a couple things of what we did to see how it fits within our site. So number one is uh, we took Witten Woods. It, it's, it's, I believe, about 235,000 square feet. Our building's 215. And you can see that this area here is two floors. And we struggle to fit this on our site. So this, this, is, this is now our site looking north. Here, here's the junior high here. Here is the um, football stadium parking lot. Um, and you can see the red dash area is our buildable area. So this would fall within Eagle's Way. It would hit the bleachers if we use that same footprint. Doesn't work. We actually took Sycamore Junior High, which is 171,000 square feet. This is two stories. This is two stories, and this is one story. Again, thinking about deliveries and access and trying to get a fire truck around here, it, it doesn't it doesn't fit. 171,000 square feet with two stories. Here is the Harrison one. This is, this is three floors here, and this is two floors here. It does fit. It does get, you can th think that you can get a loading dock in here or uh, parking around it. So when you start to see the quantity of blue, we're just doing a little quick fit study to see what fits. 
and this is informing our team that we need to look at a three-story academic wing. And so that really will let me do some PR stuff, and then I'll turn it to you. So, so this is where we are right now. Uh, we, are, we are at the point where we have a, uh, something called a program of requirements, a POR, and this is basically a large spreadsheet that um, adds all the spaces together. So you can see there's going to be 67,000 square feet of academic spaces. If I go to the academic tab, here's what it looks like. You can see there's 56 classrooms, four labs, eight science classrooms, teacher prep rooms, individual restrooms, material storage, all these things, 67060, it goes over here. So we've gone through with, with MISTI and, and programmed all the components of this new school. We've looked at special ed, administrative, the media center, and so on and so forth. You can see it goes down to the quantity of toilets. And you'll see here at the bottom, 205 is, is really where we've, where we've landed. One of the things we are allowed to do is we have a 10% threshold of reducing spaces. Uh, the state allows us to go down by 10%. So we've elected to take that 10% on the classrooms. It's very typical to do 900 square foot is what the state says, but they said you can go down as eight, small as 810. If we do that for every, every nine classrooms, you get an extra classroom if you have save that 90 square feet out of 10 classrooms. So, so we've, we also made sure on our tours to walk classrooms and to count the ceilings and make sure ceiling tiles is a way to measure a classroom and to figure out if A10 is appropriate. And so we all agreed that, that we're actually trying to target eight, 830 to 825 square feet for classrooms. So, so at that point, I'm going to turn it over to, to Greg. Um, are there any questions on the content that I've, I've shared so far? Kind of the tours or uh, the programming. Y yes, I believe your classrooms now are closer to 650 to 750. So we, we have measured the existing junior high. A lot of schools from the 60s and 70s built about that range. Um, and then throughout the 80s, they kind of grew. In the 90s, they grew. Um, but now, Believe it or not, with not having, like, we don't need desktops in, in schools, in classrooms anymore. We can go with laptops. You can kind of tighten it up a little bit. We're not getting rid of that square footage. We're just repurposing it for other learning spaces. So that's one thing I want to be clear on. The other thing is that the, um, the ninth grade wing is also A10. We measured the, the ninth grade wing. So that's, that's the standard size. And then Boyd and Seipel, those new classrooms are also 810. So. The thing that's different now is we have higher ceilings, we have larger windows, and when you have that and you walk into a space, it does feel bigger. So a 650 square foot classroom with you know eight foot ceilings feels pretty small, but when you when you make some changes, it, it improves it. So, all right, I'm going to hand it over to Greg, and he's going to show some diagrams that we've developed, and then ultimately land on kind of the, the floor plan for the academic wing. Thanks, Jeremy. So what we've been talking about to this point is more about the quantitative data, kind of the, the measurable stuff, the sizes of the classrooms, the number of classrooms. What we're gonna start to get into now is kind of the arrangement of those spaces, how they might look and feel as they kind of relate to each other, which begins to suggest how those spaces could be used, uh, how teachers could teach, how students can learn in those spaces. When we think about the individual spaces themselves, we think about the connectivity of these spaces, um, not just the connectivity to each other, but uh, connectivity to things like the environment, uh, making sure that we have daylight that comes into all of our spaces. We know that daylight is way better in our spaces than, than our, the artificial light that we see in a lot of the older schools, especially ones that were designed in the 60s and 70s during kind of the energy crisis. So the connection to the environment is really important. Uh, connection to the community, so that these spaces have a connection to uh, the teams that we're trying to build. Uh, we've talked about the teaming model here at the Milford Middle School and having those students be able to connect to each other in their teams uh, and then those connections beyond the classrooms uh, to the broader community. Uh, connection to each other, to the classmates, uh, to their classmates. So there's opportunities you'll see in some of the diagrams for team teaching where we can have classrooms that open up to each other like Charlie uh, pointed out and the tour of the, what was it, the Harrison Junior School, uh, where they had two classrooms that could open up to each other. So connections to each other, to the classmates. 
and then ultimately connection to the information, whether that's information coming from uh, technology, information coming from the teacher on a, a teaching board, or information coming from collaboration with each other. So th this idea of connecti connectivity for all of our spaces is really important. When we look at a more kind of traditional linear kind of double loaded corridor, corridor model that you see at the top, we just see spaces that are kind of lined up next to each other, uh, all connected to a corridor. Most of them, because of the way they used to be built with uh, block walls, didn't really have connections between each other. So students would just go out the classroom, down the hall, into the next classroom, and there was just not a lot of connection. Uh, when we start to rethink that strategy, we start to take some of these classrooms and simply reposition them relative to that circulation space, that blue space there, we can start to consolidate that blue space into what uh, Charlie mentioned was the extended learning areas. So we take the, basically the same amount of square footage and now we create this space that is now connected better to these five classrooms and becomes an extended learning space where students can now go outside and have projects, have uh, different types of seating out there where they have that kind of flexibility to learn in a different environment. Uh, all of this provides the kind of flexibility and, and more student-centered learning types of environments that we want to create here. So this is just a, a simple rearrangement of spaces that creates a, a new type of space. And then when we start to overlay that notion of connectivity to the environment, to, uh, to their classmates, to the community, and to the information, we start to see diagrams like this where the classrooms have more, more openness to each other, uh, still, each classroom has connection to like a, a teaching wall. It's more of kind of a traditional delivery model, which we will rely on at, from time to time. Uh, but we also want to make sure that the students can connect to these extended learning areas and then ultimately to the environment, to the outside. Um, having that connection, not just for bringing daylight into the space, but for students to be able to go outside is an important part of uh, the connection to the community. When we think about the, the spaces in terms of how they want to function, the, the old traditional model of the solid walls uh, that were inoperable, that were impenetrable, uh, created a very kind of isolated condition uh, where, where students couldn't really kind of connect to each other. That is still relevant today when we want students to have that kind of focused testing, uh, which is part of our uh, educational delivery. But there are times when we want those students to be able to collaborate. So we want those, those walls to kind of go down. And we can't really just take the walls down and rebuild them up. I mean, these guys would be in business forever if we did that. Uh, but we do have opportunities to be able to create walls that can open up or doors in walls that can create connections between spaces. So we create this uh, spectrum of isolation to collaboration within all of our spaces that allows that kind of flexibility throughout the school day, throughout the school year, so that the students have access to the ability to kind of be in smaller or isolated kind of focus driven spaces or more open collaborative type spaces. So then when we overlay that on our diagram, we can see this might be a, a scenario where all of the classrooms are closed down, where students might be more focused uh, for testing, uh, but then as we move through either the, the school week or the school year, there might be opportunities to open up all of these classrooms to each other. So it's a much more flexible, fluid environment. And so if we think of these as kind of a, a team uh, that we're going to be looking at here at the Milford Middle School, the, the teams have access to each other, to the information, to those collaborative spaces. Uh, and that's something that will be kind of a, a driver for the design as we go through. So we, w we went from that kind of more abstract diagrams, and then we started getting into uh, diagrams that are really driven on this team model. And on the left, you'll see more kind of a traditional uh, double-loaded corridor linear type uh, uh, arrangement of spaces that, that's really kind of team-driven, where you have four classrooms that maybe are, two of them are side by side, two of them are across the hall. Uh, but this is really kind of limiting in terms of the ability of the students to access the rest of the components of the school. Uh, and, and because of the way these spaces are arranged, it doesn't create a lot of collaboration space in between. So students are either in the classroom or they're in the circulation. We kind of want to avoid that. And so if we went to a more, let's say, kind of equalized model, not ideal because we're not going to build around school, but a more kind of equalized distribution, if there was a way to start the students to bring them into this academic space from the center, they could have equal distribution to all four of the, of the teams, and then each of the classrooms has access to this kind of space that if we start to fill that space in, 
with some collaborative area like you see in the green there, uh, or if we start to kind of take their traditional model and spread that out, we create those uh, collaboration spaces that are now between the classrooms or just outside the classrooms. And so we're starting to move both of these diagrams towards a, a 21st century. Um, and then if we take this idea of this kind of radial arrangement and we start to influence maybe these uh, more rectangular uh, teams on the left and create kind of a radial model and then start to normalize the shape of the diagram on the right, uh, we can start to see this kind of uh, plus sign shape begin to emerge uh, between these two diagrams. Uh, still the same kind of access to the uh, collaborative learning spaces in the green uh, on both of them, but a more efficient, more buildable type of space. And then as we start to, to bring those uh, even more uh, defined into this idea of these teams with the collaboration spaces, but still kind of access to a central space, they start to really begin to look like each other as we kind of go through this. And so ultimately, uh, as we expand these and then add some of those additional program elements, like Charlie was talking about in the program of requirements, uh, we begin to add uh, maybe some laboratory type spaces, uh, certainly restrooms for students so they don't have to go too far from their teams uh, to access restrooms, uh, mechanical spaces to serve uh, these, these academic wings. Uh, we can start to see how the diagrams are becoming very similar. And then ultimately, when we land on something like this, it it's really begins to epitomize the, the goals of everything that we've talked about in terms of the connectivity, the collaboration, where, where we, we're showing classrooms that are arranged in pairs, where we have uh, potential teaming relationships uh, between, between the classrooms. Uh, we have connections to project labs or laboratory type spaces. Uh, where teams one and teams two could share a project lab. Same thing with restrooms. Teams one and teams two have their own access to restrooms so students don't have to go too far outside of their team uh, to get to that. The yellow spaces begin to be those small group rooms, uh, which are part of the kind of breakout for the 21st century type of dis, uh, learn educational delivery, uh, where students can come out into the extended learning areas for more collaborative work, but if students need to break off either in smaller groups or dedicated work with a teacher or a specialist, uh, they have access to these uh, more individualized small group rooms within their teams. Uh, you can also see some distribution of uh, resource rooms, That's, those are part of our special education, uh, as well as some distribution of potential media center spaces uh, that are all kind of part of that larger program that we consider. But effectively what this becomes is kind of a driver for how we might think of this academic space and the relationships between them and how it serves the students kind of going forward. So we want to ask you to take a quick survey. Uh, so if you have a phone on you uh, and you can scan the QR code, um, this uh, will link you to a Google uh, form survey. It's actually administered by the district, so the results go to them. I don't even get to see it. Um, but we are looking for um, feedback from, from you folks. I believe this is also going to be sent out district-wide for those who, um, who haven't participated here. So um, we're just looking to see kind of who, who what school, home school you're representing, if you're from one of the elementaries. Um, and there's some other some other components. So, um, if I would have planned correctly, I would have had some break music to play real quick. So, I'll let you guys take that. So, it should take a couple minutes. So, I'll let you do that real quick, and then we're going to go into a Q and A mode here towards the end. So. Yeah, turn your camera on. And no, uh, just touch the QR on your screen. She needs to phone a friend.
All right, we'll go one more minute. Did you get the survey done? Good. Yes. You need a microphone. Come over here and use the mic, please. I just wanted to add something that uh, we were just discussing that I wanted you to know that we have already um, be we've already started to speak to students as well and so uh, towards the end of the school year couple last couple weeks we met with students and we were just talking about how ideas for these things come from all over the place and even just with the preliminary meeting with students their ideas are just just extraordinary it, it's just like made me smile and just was so wonderful to just see their ideas just coming and coming and coming. And like, you know, one of the things they said uh, was they liked how our hallways are color coded. And it was just like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, that's a great point. And it was just really nice to see the, the students sharing their ideas. Yeah, and you, and you use the color coding as a wayfinding method and actually a communication method if you're having to page and, and say, hey, folks in the, go to the red hallway or whatever, but they acknowledge that, and so that's a great feedback for us where we're taking notes, and when we start to lay this out, our pods and modules might be set up in that manner, so. All right, so it looks like folks have had five minutes for the survey, so we wanna open the floor for questions about design, construction, and you need to use the mics so it can be streamed accordingly. So, um. hi. hi. Is it working? Yeah. I'm Barb Shreve. I am a Milford resident. I have a junior high child and a side pelt sixth grader that will be going into this junior high. And one thing that I've been communicating to the school about is um, my passion for safety in the building, mm -hmm. and that hasn't. Um, really been talked about and I feel that with us having this new building we can really look at it from the ground up and I come from a place of love and concern mm -hmm. I myself was in an active shooter in my my workplace mm -hmm. so I know it can happen we just saw Texas mm -hmm. that's very important to me um, so I don't hear any talk about safety when we talked about this building I sure. hear a lot about open spaces, open community, but what does the research say about that? Okay. And in a perfect world, I would love that, open community, kids like that, but I don't know that that's where the world is right now, Yeah. that we need to, to really review this. And does, does Milford community want all this openness, or do we want more controlled spaces mm -hmm. and access? Because I learned just fine in walls that didn't open and in communities. Okay. And I have a junior high kid, and if you know how much drama's in junior high, mm -hmm. open spaces aren't always the best yeah. either. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. the truth, no. but yeah. I, I mean, there's many things that I learned from being in the active shooter. There's many things that other um, agencies around here that have had active shooters sure. have learned. I think we need to reach out to those organizations and say, what did you learn? What did you implement in your building? Um, and I think we need to have this talk sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, one thing we learned was the importance of sally ports in our buildings. And for people that don't know, it's a sally port is an open space that has, you go through one door, it's an open space, then there's another door. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be two two times they'd have to try to enter. Yep. Things like that. Um, yep. The level of glass that we put into our buildings, the mm -hmm. level of glass that we use in different areas. Um, these are all things that I think really need to be talked about early because they could be expensive, but then maybe we have to cut out some of the things that aren't necessary. Okay. So I really want that to get to the forefront and be talked about quickly and, and understand, does the community want this open concept? Mm -hmm or are we leaning more towards? I would love to see this school be an example for other communities of, of a safe school that thought and love went into it and research went into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. all right, I've got a great answer. I can try to answer your questions. 
Um, so safety and security, honestly, is our number one topic at every meeting we have. Um, we aren't at the point right now of being able to present any of those ideas or concepts because we're just playing around with blocks of color and moving them around. So we don't have a floor plan yet. We're still moving things around. We don't even have doors or windows shown. At a certain point this summer, we're going to say, okay, the floor plan's kind of locking in. Are we feeling good? And then we're going to then start to overlay a lot of our safety and security processes. Um, SHP has been doing schools for, for years, and we actually have, have an internal process um, that we amend after every situation in a school safety situation. We started it actually uh, 15, 20 years ago with the chief of police of Hamilton's, uh, city of Hamilton. And um, we have a document that, that we've amended and amended and amended based off the things that we've learned and found out. You use the term sally ports. We use the term barriers or vestibules um, to create containment. So the biggest research right now in school safety for secure, safety and security is containment, is slowing people down, and it's having, having zones that you can contain somebody. So for example, this is a, this is a vestibule here. Um, that door might be locked, you might need to get buzzed in, but then once you get into this next level, you need to get permission. So um, there are a lot of, a there will be a ton of active measures, like security cameras. Um, uh, I don't know about metal detectors, that has not been decided, that doesn't really happen in Ohio schools, uh, but there will be a lot of passive measures, tons of passive security measures. We look at sight lines. Um, in fact, we've got schools that we've designed where there's, think of this as a hallway, and here's a, 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 a window right here. We've actually looked at sight lines and done floor patterns where if someone's running down the hallway and they can have a line, that's their line of sight where they can see in, and we put floor patterns where you're safe. It's sad, but true. You got to do that and think about that. that. That was from a school client. That's a, that's a passive safety measure. Bollards, curbs, uh, preventing people from driving into schools. That's, a, that's a, a thing that we have. It's on our list. And so we um, ultimately will have a, a variety of meetings with local jurisdictions, Miami Township, um, Fire, uh, Claremont County Police, um, Sheriff, our security uh, uh, professionals who do security, uh, secured vestibules, access control, key cards. Um, the Harrison School I showed you has a key card in every single door, every single classroom door. You got a beep to get in. So they, they have that in a mode so they can go in a lockdown mode. So there is a ton of things that we can talk about. We can make a school look and feel like a jail, but we can also make a school look and feel very inviting and safe where kids know that they can be protected if a situation were to happen. Um, another thing I, I, that's recent in pretty much every single school I do ha has it now is coatings on glass. And so we've talked about a lot of glass and transparency and daylight, and, our, and we have to have that with the state of Ohio but we can put coatings on it that actually can be shot, but they stay in place. And so if you want to look up 3M, the chemical company, 3M, they make whatever, um, they have coatings that go on glass, and there's videos of people. We have to tell the fire chief about it because you can't even get through it with an ax. That's how much of a barrier. And, and we know seconds and minutes count. Not in Texas, obviously, with the situation that happened there. Their problem was a ma an analog breach. A door was cleft open, and so we, we track that. So my point, my long-winded answer to you is, is I'm not talking about today because we don't have enough to really talk about it, but it's a part of our thoughts. The courtyard that we have shown is for secured out, outdoor play where a teacher can let kids out and know that there's walls around them and that kids can go out and be in a courtyard and be safe and not have to worry about someone driving by. So we are looking at it, we are thinking about it, and there will be measures all throughout. So. I don't, I, Yep, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, I, and I would well, say the the open classrooms that we're showing, it's, it's, it's not open classrooms, they're still, they're, they're contained classrooms, there's five classrooms in a row that we're showing that are, that are our neighborhood, there are walls in between all of them, there might be openings that can be mobile that might slide or move, so it is not an open classroom concept. I, I went to a high school that was an open classroom, so these are contained classrooms where there will be f 25 kids within a classroom and there's a door, but there might be features that allow th this flexibility to happen. Um, 
safety and security is also one of those things that we're going to do, but we don't widely publicize it. It's one of those things that the, the operators know about it, the principals know about it, the Board of Education may know about it, but we don't blast, oh, here's all the things that we do to shut off air. Or, there's a school in Indiana that has smoke machines in the, in the walls. If there's an active shooter, that they, they can you know, hit that. There are schools that have the teachers and principals have um, uh, I've fallen, I can't get up, uh, like little, little Pell calls, call the sheriff, like a teacher can call a sheriff. So there are a lot of safety measures that we can talk about. Some of them we kind of keep internal just for the safety and security of them. So my point is, is if I, if you want to have more detailed conversations after, I'd be happy to talk to you about some of the other things or show you that white paper. It's seven pages of, of things that we talk about and integrate. And it comes, if it, I've never, you know, 10 years ago, I wasn't talking about floor patterns because of a shooter. So, and I have kids too. My kids, you know, I was, uh, my kids had a, a drill where they were moved into a, an active shooter drill. And, and my son said, I said, what'd you do? He said, I had to hold a scissor and a, st and a stapler. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, I, that, in case they come in, we're going to throw them. And I was like, that's really where we are? Like, I didn't even know my own kid had that. I, I know, but like a, a nine-year-old and a scissors is, it might hurt, but it's not going to do much. We need better measures than that. We need better gateways. We need better, you know, there's more technology and other things that we can integrate within our design. Are we going to solve it all? No. But we're a component that we can help. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can talk to we, the... Yeah, we have yeah, a, yeah. Uh, we're going to have a Citizens Advisory Commission as well. Yeah. Um, Jeff and I are going to meet with um, our local um, fire and police chiefs later this month. And again, as Charlie mentioned, like a lot of it's not going to be published. It just yeah. can't be. Yeah. Um, it's it's on a need to know basis. It, 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 um, yeah. Jeff has a, a and myself as well. But really, the, the district has a great relationship with our fire and chiefs, both Miami Township and Milford. And we have these conversations on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff is definitely connected more so than, than most of us. Um, and we will continue to do that. Um, as soon as this all went down, there were you know, different conversations happening um, with all of us uh, about Texas, mm -hmm. what the learning is from that particular incident. And we'll continue to do that. That's just something we do. Um, and as Jeff said, and I agree with him, Milford's been at the very front of um, safety and um, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. You want to add anything, this, Jeff? Well, I'll, one thing I'll add is this, this school building will probably have 125 to 150 cameras throughout it on the inside and outside, all going to a DVR that re records it all for at least seven days. So if there's incidents, it gets, it's getting documented. And in that case, you want to see the cameras. You want to walk up and say, oh, geez, they're recording me. They're so small these days. I mean, that's... Believe it or not, that one in the corner up there is somewhat of a big one now. There's even smaller than that. So um, we're we're doing our best. Um, it's there's behavioral things that need to change. There's other there's other things in the world that, that are going to have to be a part of this. Um, but it's something that we take very serious. And, um, and and as I said, in each situation, one of one of our senior partners at the firm who's been with us for over 35 years will update our own internal white paper, and we. We try to learn and, and integrate the things to the best of our ability. So, all right. Uh, other questions? Emily? Nope. Similar. S similar vein. Yeah. So my question is more about uh, ongoing costs. We talk a lot about the capital, the the expenditure, the investment. Mm -hmm. um, as you're going through the iterations of choices, whether it's with the community, with the teachers, are, are you identifying that, yes. you know, option A will give you this, option B will be more expensive, but will give you other things? Um, because ultimately, this has got to be, quote unquote, a maintenance-free school. Yeah. Um, maintenance free is a tough, that's a tough challenge there. It's a nice terminology. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say we go down the path of, of trying to look at the total co cost of a, of, a, of a decision. So for example, flooring is, is one where we can look at first cost of a floor. Generally, it's, it's pretty cheap. It's a dollar fifty to, to two fifty a square foot to in, install a piece of tile and have it there. But you got to wax it. You got to strip it, and every year you wax it and strip it. You got to move furniture out. There's a lot of cost to a, a, a dollar fifty to two dollar 
piece of tile. We can look at flooring that's five bucks and it may need maintenance you know, every five years. We can look at systems that are seven bucks. And again, it's that first cost that's the, that we're trying to hit. And so we do look at total life cycle cost. Uh, we, will, we will do that with HVAC systems. We will look at that with roofing. We will look at that with um, technology systems, anything that kind of has a life to it. And we, we, the thing with the state of Ohio is the, the Ohio School Design Manual is kind of our, our, the book. It's about that thick. And it, it gives you good, better, and best options. And so we can go good on everything. You probably have a little more maintenance costs. Or we can go better. It goes down, and best is usually your Cadillac system. Uh, we're not in a market right now where we can afford all best. We just can't. With the rising prices of everything, we just can't. But we will work with, with Jeff Johnson on the kind of the mission critical things. Um, HVAC controls, HVAC management, you know, the things that require a lot of people, we know that gets expensive. So it's a topic that we're very familiar with and we can go on all day talking about floor waxes and, and all those components. But I appreciate your, your comment and it comes in very early on in the design. An another one? So building for the future. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about flexibility, adaptability. We want this building to last for 120 years, not so 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what are you putting into the thought process for 10 years out, for 15 years out? And I'll just use yeah. the example of, of the open space, and you said it's safe and secure. Mm -hmm. Well, drones can drop bombs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, again, what are we doing? What are we thinking? We can't think out 60 years. Correct. We can't think out 30. But at least for the next 10 or 15. Yeah. So, I mean, you heard Greg use the term 21st century learning, 21st century learning. And I'm thinking, Greg, in, the, in this uh, job, we're going to hit one quarter into the 21st century. When do, you stop, when do we stop using that term? Um, to me, it's, it's, it's looking at, you know, we can look at how we all learned. We, we may have learned with five rows by five columns with 25 kids and the chalkboard and someone talking with chalk and clapping erasers. We may have learned with marker boards and more color. We may have learned with projectors. We, we, we know throughout time people learn differently. Everybody learns differently. And so some people learn in group settings, some people learn in small group settings, some people learn talking with people and just collaborating. So what, what we try to provide is, is diversity in the learning spaces and flexibility. And so there may be spaces where large groups can meet. It might be 50, 60 kids can, can collaborate with one teacher or two teachers. It might be areas where smaller groups can learn, where it might be five kids and a, and a staff member. So can we predict that? It's really hard. One of the things we do at our company is we really do look beyond our walls. Um, Greg and I went out to California. We went to a place called High Tech High. It's a very, very progressive, very, very forward thinking. It's all project-based learning. And so they, they um, they take projects and they try to incorporate all the, the, the topics, science, math, uh, technology, language arts, uh, all throughout a project. And at the end, these kids bring in the community and they, they, it's presentation skills, it's soft skills. So I think we kind of are, are, are in a better spot today than where we've been the past 20 years as far as a balance of technology, a balance of, of you know, rough, hardcore academics versus just preparing kids for the world and soft skills. Um, I, I bought a car for my son, he's 16, and I handed him the phone and I said, here you go, negotiate with the guy. And he goes, why am I doing this? And I said, because you need to learn how to negotiate, kid. So we know that learning is more than just things in a book. So it, it, for me to predict the future, it's tough, but we try to stay on the cusp, and I think the thing we're trying to do here is to provide flexibility in that balancing act of safety, security, and an exciting environment where kids wake up and say, man, I love Milford Junior High. I want to jump out of bed and go there because I, I love the interactions I have and the things I do every day. So it's kind of a long-winded, generalized answer. Other questions? Um, when I present and it's 79 degrees on a Tuesday afternoon, it usually questions are low. So and sunny, sorry. All right. Well, this will be posted to ICRC. I think they're streaming it. It will also it's obviously being recorded. Uh, please share this. Um, our project is going to be as good as the feedback we get. So please share that survey. Take it, and we and we're, we we are date we are in the mode of collecting data. We need to know things from you. So if it's on your mind, please send it. Get it to the administrators here. And we'll, we'll we'll add it to the, the 
the ingredients. Oh, one more question. Yes, yeah, so just critical timeline. Uh, when's the next session? Because I'm, I'm all about communication too. Okay. And, and I, I, I'd like to hear a commitment that, you know, based on the path, yeah. this is where we need input again from the community. Give them enough notice and get them prepared. Okay. Um, I want to work with the administrators here to figure that out because I know we're entering summer. I think if we could do one more session before school starts, a community session, like early August, that would work really well for us because we are moving uh, down a trail and we, you know, we want to share that information. So um, if, we could, if we could meet you know, in, in uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks, that would be work for our schedule. We'll shoot for the first week of August. Okay, there we go. First week of August. We'll, we'll try, to, we'll try to pin the date down here in the next week and, and okay. advertise it. So, thank you. Okay, well, uh, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for participating. We appreciate you coming out, and uh, we'll hang around if there's more questions. Thanks.